Welcome back to the Marshall Center Voices. I'm Valbona Zanelli. Today, I have the great pleasure to talk with General Christopher Cavalli, the Commanding General of the U.S. Army, Europe, and Africa. General Christopher Cavalli is the first Commanding General of the recently consolidated U.S. Army, Europe, and Africa Command. He has distinguished himself in numerous leadership positions in Europe and Asia. He also served in the Pentagon as Director for Russia on the Joint Staff and as the Deputy Executive Assistant for the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Having attended both Princeton and Yale Universities, General Cavoli also attended the National Defense University in Washington, D.C. as a Fellow. And what we are most honored and proud of is that General Cavoli is a Distinguished Fellow of the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies. General Cavoli, we're delighted and grateful you're able to join us today and tell us about all the good things going on with the Army. Very happy to be here. Thank you for the invitation, Dr. Zanelli, and uh, I, I look forward to uh, having the chance to be in contact with uh, your Marshall Center alumni. Thank you very much, General. You have had a very distinguished career in the Army, and a significant part of your time abroad has been spent in Europe. What I'd like to start with is getting your thoughts on the current strategic security environment and also specifically as it relates to great power competition. What do you see as the key differences between today's strategic environment in Europe and that of 30 years ago? Yeah, wow, so that's a, that, that's a big question. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll go even farther back than 30 years ago because um, I'm in some ways a little bit a child of the Cold War and the, and the American, European, the transatlantic alliance. I was uh, born in I, the son of, a, of an Italian immigrant who came to the United States after the Second War. Um, he joined the army, became an officer, and uh, I was therefore born like so many sons of U.S. Army officers in Würzburg, Germany in 1964. And my life after that has always included uh, much time spent in the U.S. Army or associated with the U.S. Army in Europe. Um, so, you know, if we reach all the way back, Val, the, the, um, the Army in Europe used to have a pretty simple task. It was a hard task, but a simple one. There was a big monolithic threat that we as an alliance were facing. Uh, the U.S. was a cornerstone of that alliance, and um, we knew exactly where we expected to fight, exactly against what force we expected to fight. Um, and so we postured ourselves right exactly where we believed we should be. And, um, you know, so the U.S. Army, the Army alone had uh, a quarter of a million, more than a quarter of a million soldiers here um, at the height of the Cold War. Uh, when I came through high school, I was in Vicenza, Italy. Um, uh, my first years in the Army at the end of the Cold War were in Vicenza, Italy, so I was intimately involved with these defensive plans. And it was all very well articulated, but it was quite simple. We were in one or two countries. We were focused on a geographical area. We knew what to expect. After the war, after the Cold War and the wall came down, all of our countries um, saw a new world. And uh, our countries, justifiably enough, took a peace dividend, as we called it, and we began to scale down our force structure over here. The U.S. Army was no different than anybody else. We went from an army of 780,000 to an army of about 450,000 some years later. And here in Europe, we went from having two corps and multiple divisions to a very, very small structure. We paused a little bit during the Balkan peacekeeping operations, um, and then we became after 2001, after 9-11, we became a force generators for the Middle East, for their conflicts in the Middle East. But the whole time in the background, our force posture was going down, 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 until um, in 2013, the last American tanks left Europe. And uh, it was in the newspaper, last American tanks leave Europe. And it seemed altogether proper that we would do this. We no longer had the monolithic uh, uh, Warsaw Pact threat. Um, we had other things, terrorism, to deal with. Um, the smaller scale contingencies in the Balkans had convinced us that we were in sort of a post-war period, and everything seemed to make sense. In 2008, something happened, though. Uh, the quick 
war between Russia and Georgia. And then in 2014, the real wake-up call came home. So just after our tanks left Europe, um, uh, Russia um, sponsored an invasion of the eastern portion of Ukraine and illegally annexed Crimea. And that uh, has driven many, many things in the alliance since then. In my own country's army, in the U.S. Army, it drove a sudden understanding that great power competition had returned and that large-scale combat operations were no longer unthinkable in Europe. And so we began to turn around and reconstruct those parts of our force structure and our military posture here that were necessary not just to handle the small contingencies we'd become accustomed to, but also to handle the possibility of large-scale mobile warfare. Uh, and since my time in uh, U.S. Army Europe, first as the commanding general at 7th Army Training Command over in Grafenwehr, and uh, now for the last three years as the commanding general of U.S. Army Europe, we have been focused on that. We have made a number of changes to include increases to our force posture that enable that. Well, thank you, General. That's amazing. You gave us the history of 50 years in just very comprehensively in two, in two minutes. Uh, General, there are a lot of positive events regarding the Army in the press. So much so, and it's hard to begin uh, to know where to begin. But let me start with Defender Europe 21. This is an exercise that involves a lot of moving pieces. There are 28,000 multinational forces coming from 27 different countries, planning to train into numerous planning, uh, training areas. And then there is also the logistics of moving equipment from the United States to Europe through different ports of entry and onward into 13 different countries. What I'd like to ask you is to give us the strategic context of this important exercise. Why is Defender Europe 21 so important? And what does success look like for you? Well, uh, that's a terrific question. And um, I'll reach for strategic context back to the little history we were just describing a couple of moments ago. Um, so as we built down our force structure in Europe after the Cold War, what we in effect did was move from a forward postured strategy to a reinforcement strategy. And the reinforcement strategy is, uh, uh, it's easy to show on a piece of paper, it's hard to do in real life. Um, as you can imagine, moving thousands of vehicles, thousands, dozens of thousands of soldiers rapidly across the Atlantic, through seaports and airports, and then along railroads, roadways, canals, and intra-theater sea lift. To do that requires quite a bit of expertise. That expertise cannot be gained simply um, from a paper exercise uh, because the expertise is actually part of an entire system that starts with our soldiers knowing how to tie their tanks down on rail cars all the way up to our ability to coordinate transatlantic ship movements and to guard them with the ships of second fleet during the, during the, the uh, transit. So the, the, the effort to reinforce Europe must be rehearsed. And um, uh, typically when we talk about readiness in, the, in armies, we think about the readiness of a, a battalion or a brigade or a tactical organization. But there is also this question of strategic readiness, the ability of the United States to deploy forces at scale across oceans to do what needs to be done at the time of need. And our strategic readiness was not where it, wa where it needed to be because of um, the wars in the Middle East that we had been handling in a rotational fashion and for all the other reasons I discussed a couple of moments ago. Uh, therefore, in 2018, the U.S. Army decided that we needed to return to a program of rehearsal of these large movements. Um, and we, we set 2020 as the date, and we invented the tw Defender 2020 exercise, $350 million exercise to bring 20,000 U.S. soldiers with heavy equipment over here. Um, we know the history of that one, um, just as, the, uh, as ships were unloading, um, um, we ran into the COVID pandemic, and we had to make the very difficult decision to curtail much of that exercise. But truth be told, Val, 
Um, by that time, we had already moved 13,000 pieces of vehicular equipment uh, to include 800 tanks all the way over here, unloaded them, got them into staging areas. We had pulled all of our pre-positioned equipment that's located in warehouses scattered around Europe, pulled them out and moved them all to an assembly area. And we'd brought almost 10,000 soldiers over. So we did do some of those, some of those um, um, movements. So the overall strategic concept though, is we need to do those movements throughout Europe because we don't know where the crisis will occur. Defender 20 had been focused on Northeastern Europe, but Southeastern Europe is, is, is also a place uh, that requires attention from the Western Balkans all the way over to the other side of the Black Sea. And so for Defender 21, we have decided to exercise the ports and the airports and the rail lines and the roadways throughout Southeastern Europe. Um, the strategic concept is to build that strategic ability, that strategic readiness to deploy our forces into the theater smoothly and quickly. Now, once we get here, as you know, there will be four different exercises that make up, um, uh, that make up Defender 21. There'll be parachute assaults, uh, both in Northeastern Europe and in Southeastern Europe. There will be a large logistics operation that's begun just uh, yesterday in Albania at the port of Durij, bringing um, what we call joint logistics over the shore to move logistics without using port infrastructure. And we're going into all these different activities, which will lead us to operational readiness and tactical readiness. When we arrive at training areas, we will link up with our allies and with our allies from uh, uh, more than 25 countries participating. Um, we will practice tactical tasks that relate to the sorts of operations we contemplate needing to be prepared for in the future. So it takes us from strategic readiness in terms of deployment all the way down to squads and platoons interoperating um, uh, together in training events uh, in Romania, Bulgaria, throughout the Balkan nations, and all the way up to Estonia as well. Thank you, General. As you point out, a good part of this exercise will take place in the Balkans. Why is it significant to exercise in this region? So for, for a huge number of reasons. Uh, first, as a strictly military matter, um, when we think about large scale operations that might be necessary for deterrence, um, or even in the case of conflict in the Black Sea region, you gotta get there. Yeah, you have to get there. As we know, the Montreux Convention controls access uh, to the Black Sea and puts certain limitations on us. So we need alternative ways to get from the US and from throughout Europe, all of our allies, across Southeastern Europe into, into to the possible point of need. One of the ways to do that is to exercise the ports in the Balkans, um, uh, whether Koper, uh, um, or Zadar, or Durez, or Alexandropoli, a port we're very excited about in northeastern Greece. All of these provide us the opportunity to exercise that infrastructure and to rehearse our ability to use it, and then to prove the military mobility between those ports and the point of need. That's, that's the first reason. This is, this is a great opportunity to establish mobility throughout uh, southeastern Europe. Second, though, um, the Balkans remain a complicated place. And the Balkans remain a place where um, we are not the only country and the Alliance is not the only organization competing for access and for influence. And so it's necessary for us to be present there and to uh, get together with our allies and our partners there and to have the sort of rich professional interaction that will sustain our strategic ties with those nations. Um, so those are the two real important reasons to be doing it down there. Well, thank you. And as a follow-up, how important is Defender 21 when it comes to developing interoperability between forces and building relationships with allies and partners? Oh, it's fundamental. It's, it's absolutely fundamental because it gives us the opportunity um, to train with our allies and our partners at multiple echelons simultaneously. So as you know, we already do a lot of work on interoperability training, but it's mainly at a, at a tactical level and one echelon at a time. Like if it's a brigade training with another brigade or two battalions training together. 
you get a lot of benefit from that, but only a certain amount of, of the full effect. If we contemplate large-scale operations, you need an opportunity to interoperate at the squad level, at the battalion level, at the brigade level, at the division level, at the core level, and at the theater army level. Um, so Defender almost uniquely gives us the opportunity to practice interoperating at all those levels at once. Um, you mentioned relationships. So in, in NATO, we actually divide interoperability into three parts, or we say there are three facets to interoperability. The first is human interoperability, our ability as allies to understand each other, to communicate, to be able to, largely a relationship-based thing. But then there's also procedural interoperability, where we understand and have common ways to, um, to do the tactical and operational tasks needed. For instance, crossing a river. We have to, we have to agree on the procedures for doing it. And then finally, we have technical interoperability, which is quite tough, especially in communications um, and network operations um, to, to get everything lined up. So when we see the three facets of interoperability and we look across the multiple echelons, we have to be able to do that interoperability at, uh, it really becomes imperative on occasion, maybe once a year, to have a massive exercise where we get the opportunity to, to practice it all at once. General, it's so easy to sense that you're all excited and proud of all that the Army is doing. Sorry. With Sorry. Defender 21 in the news, one could overlook another big news story, which is the reactivation of the Army's Fifth Corps. Why is it so important, and what does that mean for Europe? Um, so, as we reduced our force structure in Europe after the, uh, after the Cold War, um, one of the things we did was eventually remove all of the division headquarters and all of the core headquarters from our force structure over here. As you know, 5th Corps was stationed here in Frankfurt and in 2013, 2012, headed off to Afghanistan and inactivated after that. And since that time, we've had neither a division nor a core headquarters here. So essentially, we have removed the echelonment of our command structure in this theater. This has a couple of, uh, couple of consequences. First, it means my headquarters has to deal directly with tactical units, which it's not equipped or intended to do. And this becomes difficult a little bit. It was uh, almost like picking up small coins while wearing gloves. We, we didn't have the right level of uh, uh, granular uh, un understanding to be able to do that. But most important, this headquarters cannot integrate fires, maneuver, logistics, and intelligence at the tactical level or at the operational level. It does so at the strategic theater level. So by reintroducing Fifth Corps, we have reintroduced our ability to command and control forces and to integrate their operations at the operational level. This is huge. This, this makes a massive, massive difference in our ability to plan and our ability to operate. Um, we're very pleased that uh, Lieutenant General John Kolaszewski, um, who's over in theater right now, has, is in command of the Corps. The Corps is headquartered in Fort Knox, Kentucky, while it comes up to its full operational capability, which we anticipate this autumn. And during the course of time between now and then, they will be putting a Ford command post in Poznan in Poland. And um, some of the members of that will be rotational, and some of the members of that Ford command post will be, um, will be permanently based. The, the uh, deputy commander of Fifth Corps will be, is right now Major General Terry McKendrick, and by this summer, it will be Major General Matt Van Wagen, or soon to be Major General Matt Van Wagenen, and they will live in Poznan. The rest of the Corps will be back at Fort Knox, prepared to move forward and routinely appearing on the continent um, to work with our allies and our partners here on all our tasks of interoperability and for all the purposes of deterrence. Uh, a final note on Fifth Corps that I'm very excited about. The Minister of Defense, Minister Blazak of, uh, of Poland, uh, recently named uh, Major General Adam Yokes, uh, a Polish officer and the former commander of the 6th Airborne Brigade, to move to Fort Knox, Kentucky, 
to be a deputy commanding general of the U.S. Army's Fifth Corps. This is the first time we've had such an arrangement with the Poland, and, and, and I, I'm very excited about it. But that Corps' activity will not be located, will not be limited to, to Poland. It will be responsible for operations, activities, and investments throughout the European space. General, you just walked us through Defender Europe 21 and the reactivation of the Army's Fifth Corps. All of this is taking place in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. Can you tell us a little bit about your challenges and some good lessons learned from having to maintain readiness while dealing with the pandemic? Yes, absolutely. So um, in the beginning, you know, our initial challenge was that the um, the pandemic hit right at our maximum level of effort for Defender 20. So we had forces all over the continent. We had people in every corner of every piece of transportation infrastructure in Europe. And um, like that, we had to reel everybody back in. We had to consolidate things. So the first thing was, you know, to gain control and to switch uh, to switch operations so quickly. Um, after that, we adopted the principle to follow the lead of the host nations. So, you know, um, the interesting thing about the U.S. Army in Europe is that it's the U.S. Army in Europe, and uh, we, 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 we live in other people's countries. So we were very, very careful to follow the cues and the rules of our host nations throughout. But really, at that point, it became fairly easy, Dr. Zanelli, because um, we very early on established a wide, large-scale um, capacity to test our population. As you know, we live on bases for the most part, and we had the ability to shut the gate and um, test all of our population, and we very quickly were able to get a gauge of how many people were, um, were, were sick and how many weren't, and we had a very easy ability to control it. Um, because, you know, as military people, um, I would venture to say I have uh, probably a bit more legal control over our soldiers, say, than, than the average civilian leader has over his workforce. Um, so we were able to limit uh, things pretty quickly. And so by, you know, the end of May, we were ready to go back to training at a, at a large scale. And we used our testing methodology and our um, and our training areas to establish what we called bubbles, and we tested everybody in, and we tested during the training, and we found we were able to conduct brigade level training uh, without any problem at all. That's about three to four thousand soldiers simultaneously training. Um, based on this, we had discussions with especially our Polish allies, and we returned to northwestern Poland, to Drawska Pomorskia training area, where we conducted a multi-brigade, division-level, live, wet gap crossing um, across several days. Um, in the end, we spent about three weeks together training. And at this point, we had proven to ourselves that we could conduct large-scale training in live, um, um, and then we just proceeded to do that as time went on. Of course, you know, the challenges have continued. You, you know, every now and then there's a spike and you have to stop and, and go back down. But we've been able to do it and we're very proud of the fact that we've, uh, we've kept our, our families and our civilians and our soldiers healthy. And above all, we're proud of the fact that we've been able to keep our soldiers and our organizations combat ready throughout this. In fact, we have some of the highest levels of readiness in the, in the U.S. Army right now. Um, and this is due to, first of all, the hard work of the members of U.S. Army Europe, but it's also due to the understanding and the cooperation of the host nations that we're lucky to live in. And of course, Defender Europe 21 is building on the success of Defender Europe 20. But switching topics slightly, um, first of all, congratulations to you are in order because this last November, the U.S. Army consolidated U.S. Army Europe and U.S. Army Africa under one command and you were selected to lead this command. Can you give us please a quick overview of the importance of this alignment and the anticipated benefits? Right. So, um, so starting from my role in Europe, um, I work for the commander of U.S. European Command, General Walters, who is also SACIR. 
And for General Walters, who has a joint, a multi-service headquarters, I command the Army component of his force. Previously, General Steve Townsend, who commands U.S. Africa Command, had an Army component. The Army component was headquartered in Vicenza, Italy, and was commanded by a two-star general. That Major General, now Major General Andy Rowling, still does that on a daily basis. But with the merger, I have become responsible for General Rowling's operations, activities, and investments on behalf of General Townsend. This gives us a much different, um, a much different weight when we go back to have discussions with the Department of the Army about resources. It gives me a greater ability to apply and to get U.S. Army resources for U.S. Africa Command, and it gives us a better deal, a better ability to deal with the other components, um, which are commanded by four-star officers. So the first thing it does is it gives more oomph to the Army's efforts in Africa without taking away any of the attention or dividing any of the attention of the headquarters in Vicenza, which is focused on Africa. Uh, the second thing it does is it gives me a limited ability, but some ability to move property and people and organizations from north of the Alps to, um, to operations or activities in Africa. So this makes more force available for African activities. But I think um, by far the most um, promising aspect of this alignment is that it gives me responsibilities both in Africa and in Europe, which allows me to think across the whole hemisphere and not artificially to divide African security issues from European security issues, which as we know are integrally linked together. So this allows me, for example, to leverage my natural Europe-based relationship with our allies south of the Alps with their operational interests in Africa and with their security assistance efforts in Africa. And so I'm much better able to align what we, um, our relationships up here with our security interests in Africa. So this is very, very valuable and is already, I just returned from a trip to Niger and Senegal and it's already evident to me that we will be able to make large gains because of this, th th this new arrangement uh, with me having responsibility for both of those. So I think, I think it's going to work out extremely well. In fact, we talked about Defender 21 in Europe, but there's a similar exercise taking place in Africa called African Lion 21. In fact, if I understand correctly, these two exercises are associated. So could you give us a teaser of what this exercise will involve? African Lion is going to be uh, a sort of defender exercise, except on, on the African continent. It's uh, designed to practice large-scale operations, much as Defender is, um, and it will, be it will be very large also. Just about 8,000 soldiers participating, nine different countries. Our allies from Europe, as well as our allies and partners from Africa, will all be participating. We'll do a parachute operation. We'll do some live fires, some artillery live fires. There'll be a command post exercise to practice training at higher levels. It'll take place in Tunisia and Morocco this year. And uh, both countries, by the way, extremely, extremely forward-leaning and helpful in setting all of this up. Um, there'll, be, um, there'll be forces that are projected from Europe straight down into uh, Western Africa, Northwestern Africa. Uh, so this is important because it gives us the opportunity to exercise the forces that we have up here into Africa, just as we were discussing a few minutes ago about my newfound ability to move forces back and forth. Um, so it will pay dividends in interoperability with our African uh, allies and partners. It will provide opportunities for us to coordinate our activities with our European allies operating with us down there. And for this headquarters, my headquarters in Wiesbaden, it will give us the opportunity to command and control Defender 21 
and African Lion at the same time. So this headquarters will be responsible for integrating operations on two continents simultaneously, which I think is beneficial because historically, you, you know, the entire Mediterranean basin has been one theater. Um, so uh, to have the opportunity not for it to be artificially divided, but to be treated in integral fashion again, I think is an opportunity in and of itself. So African Lion will be a great, a great event. A lot of opportunities for us to uh, make, a lot of, uh, make a lot of gains with our uh, African partners and allies, as well as with our European allies. General, often someone in your position is asked about things that worry you, things that keep you awake at night. I would like to go in a different direction. When you look around, what do you feel most confident about? Ah, um, that's a great question because I, I actually feel confident about a lot more things than I worry about. Um, so on the US side, I am very confident in, in two things. Um, the quality and the dedication and the commitment of our soldiers and officers um, amazes me every day. Um, these are folks who are living thousands of miles from their homes and who are moving in small groups across this big continent and getting so many things done. Um, so the quality of our soldiers, um, it, it just delights me every day. I started from the U.S. side but I could extend that across the alliance. It's such a pleasure to do business with members of this alliance every day. My professional relationships have never been richer here, and I'm so excited to begin to extend those relationships to my colleagues in, in, in Africa as well. That's the first thing. The second thing um, that, that I am confident about is the United States of America's contributions to security, to the defense and deterrence of this alliance, and above all, to our pursuit of a stable and peaceful world. I, I've never been more confident in our, in our dedication to that. And so in that regard, I think the two biggest things, our people and our intentions, I think uh, give me confidence every day. Everything else is a detail after that, you know? You are a Marshall Center fellow, and you know the Marshall Center very well. In fact, I hope you know that we think that you are one of our biggest supporters. And you also know that the Marshall Center has a large uh, community of Marshall Center alumni across the region. Some, I bet, you're still in touch with. Uh, is there a particular message that you would like to send to our, our Marshall Center alumni? A absolutely. So first of all, it's a pleasure to get to talk to Marshall Center alumni. Uh, it's an honor to talk to Marshall Center alumni. Marshall Center alumni um, arrive at the highest posts in their governments. Marshall Center alumni arrive at the highest ranks of their country's militaries. And wherever I go, I run into Marshall Center alumni at any level who are contributing directly to peace, stability, and security in not just their countries, but their regions. So that network of Marshall Center alumni and the common mentality um, that allows us to discuss difficult problems without animosity, uh, but allows us logically and thoughtfully to discuss difficult problems and to share perspectives with each other is, is something that should be nurtured and is a network that should be cultivated carefully by all of us. And I look forward to seeing all of the alumni uh, any place I ever go any place. Jill Cavoli, this has been a great pleasure to have you on the Marshall Center Voices. Thank you for joining us today and sharing your thoughts and insights. I can say without any doubt that you have made us all smarter on the important role of the U.S. Army in Europe and Africa and the importance of allies and partners. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And this concludes our episode of the Marshall Center Voices. Until next time, stay well.